feels like so much has happened in the news this week. I, I feel um, ridiculous not even really mentioning uh, Muhammad Ali. And, uh, and so, I, you know, this is, this is sort of ridiculous to kind of gloss over all the ways in which he was incredibly important to our society, politically, religious, uh, from a religious perspective and that sort of thing. I just, um, I, you know, was, was debating whether I should tell the kids during chancel steps that my favorite Muhammad Ali boast, of which he had many, right, um, was... I'm so fast, the other night I turned off the lights in my hotel room and I was in bed before the room got dark. Um, <laughs> so in gratitude for, uh, for him and for, um, for the many ways in which he was critical to our society, I also feel like I have to tell a story that gets to another part of our, our news this week. You will notice that I am wearing a tie this morning, and I usually wear a tie on a Sunday morning. I used to wear a clerical collar some days, back, uh, back a number of years ago. When I was going to the hospital, I would wear a collar. Uh, some days it just felt right. I got up in the morning and thought, hey, it's, it's a collar kind of day. Um, when I officiated a baptism and at some memorial services, I wore a collar. Now, wearing a collar is an interesting exercise for a lot of obvious reasons, because you are aware of how people are responding to you through their, through their body language. As you get on an elevator, people will notice the collar, and they will either brighten up, or they will take half a step away from you. <laughs> There's a, there's a modicum of power, really, associated with wearing a collar. And someone will, will say, hello, father. And in that moment, you have the option to really mess with them when you don't have any children, right? Or you want to start talking about your spouse in that moment. That could, that could really be sort of an interesting exercise. I stopped wearing a collar for a number of reasons. I actually didn't enjoy the attention at all. In fact, it felt to me uh, like it was essentially the opposite of how Jesus carried himself. I didn't enjoy the confusion about which tradition I actually belonged to. Um, and I recognized, too, that there weren't actually any special favors that came my way by wearing it. <laughs> you see, the last time I got a speeding ticket, I was wearing a collar. I was going a little too fast uh, towards the hospital. I was pulled over and I explained to the officer that I was on my way to see someone in the emergency room. This is a message to which he was entirely indifferent. He let me know that he would make a note of how polite I had been during the traffic stop. I mean, I was wearing a collar. I couldn't exactly swear at him, could I? And therefore, because I had been so nice and so pleasant during the traffic stop, I could go to court and I could try and get the points reduced on my license, which I did. Now, I did not wear a collar to court, but even if I had, I would have stud, stood before a judge and said that, yes, in fact, I was going to pay the full fine, but not for speeding, which is a four-point offense, but for a broken taillight which is for one point and which is what the prosecutor asked me if I would like to plead to. So I stood up and swore in front of a judge that I had a taillight out so that I could reduce my insurance costs in the coming years. In fact, I was encouraged by a police officer to do just that while wearing a clerical collar. So I took off my collar in part because a police officer figured out that I was just the same as everyone else, more than willing to speed, more than willing to lie to a judge, and because he had me pegged. It was true that I was willing to go to a judge and tell a small lie. It's also true that I was willing to talk about the fact that I was on my way to an emergency room to see somebody there as if I were somebody incredibly special. That I, in fact, warranted some sort of attention. Indeed, if I had gone to the emergency room and told the parishioner that I had, in fact, tried to worm my way out of the ticket, she would have been appalled. Did I actually believe in that moment that I am so special 
that the world could go- not get along without me for just a moment? That I am so special that the police officer in that moment should have given me a break? We all know these stories. Some of us, perhaps, without pointing any fingers here, of course, have lived them. Important people on their way to important meetings, needing to get to a conference or an airport, suddenly, as if they're negotiating with a hostage taker or you'd suddenly come up with the vaccine for Ebola. We also know that because sometimes law enforcement is necessarily encouraged to use discretion, that we would prefer to be treated, many of us anyway, as if we are negotiating with a hostage taker or had suddenly come up with the vaccine for Ebola. Give me a break, officer. Officer, I'm on the way to the emergency room. Come on, officer. Give me a break. What is at the root of such a plea? Is a sense of fairness? Justice? Hubris? Or something else? Am I to believe that I am special, that I should be treated differently because I have been told my whole life by my parents, by my teachers, by my friends, that I, in fact, am a special kind of person? The famous picture of Jesus at the Last Supper is all wrong. Why would people have been sat on one side of the table and not the other? It doesn't make any sense. The other reason it doesn't make any sense is all these people are in chairs or sat on stools. Nobody sat like that at a proper meal in the first century. There is a a setup for a meal, like a symposium setup. Philosophers engaged in that kind of setup when they ate. A meal would have taken place out in a courtyard, usually. The reason for that is because a host would have had the opportunity to spoil his guests with lots and lots of food and then also seem incredibly gracious by giving the extra food away to people who hung around outside the courtyard or nearby. The, the, the host has the opportunity to be gracious to both guests and to be seen as a charitable human being. The setup is usually in the shape of a U or like a horseshoe and f- the reason for that is fairly obvious. Servants would be able to enter the horseshoe and fill cups or take empty plates away without disturbing the guests. Now in this story in the gospel, we are told that Jesus takes his place, but we are not told which place that is. We do know that in his day, certain places around the table would have had a certain honor. The closer that you sat to the host, the more honored you are, and the further away, the less that you are. And we assume that he is eating, and just because he is eating, that he is eating the same food as the host of the meal. But that is not necessarily true. We have plenty of writings from ancient Rome and ancient Greece that describe how the host of a meal might, in fact, have eaten something entirely different than his guests or his clients. There's the story of Trebius who is a client who has come to Vero's table. Trebius, we are told, is given a bit of hard bread that he can scarcely break in two, and bits of old dough that have turned moldy, stuff into which no tooth may gain admittance. I love that line. No tooth may gain admittance. The patron and host Vero is served a delicate loaf of white bread, white as snow. If Trebius were to try and take some of that bread from a nearby basket, the bossy servant will tell him to put it down and learn the color of his bread. Indeed, the color of your bread was a crucial matter for Jesus and his contemporaries. It was the inverse of today where cheap bread is usually white bread that is unhealthier and healthy bread is darker bread. But in fact, in Jesus' day, darker bread, barley bread, was the stuff for peasants and the lower classes. When we pray the Lord's Prayer and we ask for our daily bread, it is because Jesus' contemporaries would not have understood anything about tomorrow's bread or next week's bread or next month's bread because you're just worrying about how your tooth will gain admittance into today's bread. 
We know that Jesus uses bread and fish as critical symbols throughout the Gospels. Why is that? Well, for Jesus and his contemporaries, it's because bread and fish went together. Despite the abundance of fish that might have been in the lakes, your typical peasant would have consumed, on average, 1.4 ounces of fish a week. A week. The empire taxed the living daylights out of fish, so it was incredibly expensive. They exported it to all corners of the empire in order to raise money for themselves. So your peasants who live nearby see all of these fish coming out of the lake and know darn well that they are not going to have a fillet or anything close to that. What you are actually going to get as your source of protein is a fish sauce. 1.4 ounces of fish per week in a fish sauce in order to get a tiny amount of protein and why? So that you could chew your bread. Indeed, when we dip bread into the cup at communion, we are mimicking Jesus and his contemporaries. This is a holdover from the first century. In many ways, we are being told that when we dip the bread into the cup, that we are identifying with brown bread people of the first century, because Jesus and his contemporaries were probably brown bread people. Some say that you are a bit special. Simon may have indicated to Jesus. But who knows whether he gave Jesus white bread. I've spoken in the past of hierarchical relationships that are evident in the Gospels. Again, what is this hierarchy? It favors wealth, of course, but what else does it favor? Clergy over lay people, urban people over rural people, especially if you're from Jerusalem, men over women, the married over the unmarried, the healthy over the ill, conformists over deviants. In looking back on that kind of hierarchy, early church theologians had a great deal of difficulty discussing the relationship that existed within the Trinity. What I mean is is that in the in the in the time of fifteen hundred or or nineteen hundred years ago, how do you describe the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit when you live in a society where the only ways in which you can identify relationship is through hierarchy and order, with someone at the top and someone at the bottom and different ranks of people in between? And so the early church fathers, particularly Gregory of Nancyensis, came up with a term called perichoresis, which is just a Greek word. Just a Greek word that describes the relationship of the actors within the Trinity. That is what is represented on the screen over there. You can see three parts and how they are turning together. That They are, in fact, if you imagine them in motion, in motion together necessarily that the early church leaders would have described perichoresis, the relationship of God within God's own self, as mutual love and happiness and joy and respect, because the parts are moving together in an eternal dance, that within that construct, it makes no sense for someone to be out of rhythm or out of step. And we all, we all know from different moments in our lives, something, something about this. That when we describe sin and falling short and, and, and not living up to what we are called to do, that, that somehow it feels like we are out of step, that we are not dancing properly, that we're not in rhythm with God. And when things kind of come together, there is a, a sense of rhythm and beat and flow. If you're not a dancer, like me, I'm not a dancer, this might not make much sense. You're not aware of much of a semblance of rhythm in your body. I can relate to that. It's hard to get in front of people and do a waltz or a tango, even with your partner. Maybe that's why God made us with lungs that breathe in time and hearts that beat, and they beat in different time signatures. They're fast and excited when we're young, and they slow down as we're aged, but we're all given a kind of music. 
We're given to understanding perichoresis at a fundamental level. We understand what it is to be in rhythm, and we understand what it is like to step away from the dance, to be out of the circle, to have lost the beat. And we know how hard it can be to pick it up again, and the harder we try, the more elusive it can be. And anybody who's tried to force love or force relationship might relate. But when you have the rhythm, when you dance the dance, you just kind of... You just kind of got it. Then turning towards the woman, Jesus says, he asks Simon, do you see this woman? Earlier, Simon has muttered that Jesus ought to have known who and what kind of woman this is. And now Jesus suggests in his question that while Simon has laid eyes on her, he has no real idea of who she is, has no real sense of her pain, no real sense of why her tears are flowing, no real sense of contrition. And now the dagger for any man hosting a meal in antiquity comes to Simon, for Jesus says to him that Simon has no real sense of hospitality. I entered your house, you gave me no water from my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven, and she has shown great love. Where does it ever say in our text that her tears are tears of sadness? Is it not possible, in fact, that her tears are tears of gratitude, gratitude for Jesus having come to the meal? This is how the gospel wants us un to understand this symbolism. That the woman who has come to me the meal is actually the one playing the role of host. The one who is offering exemplary hospitality. The washing of the feet was such a menial task that the lowest of servants would be asked to perform it for guests even guests of great honor. In extreme cases, a host would wash the guest's feet as a measure of gratitude for the guest having come, but this was a role that few would perform unless a VIP of the VIPs happened to come to your house. And in this instance, Simon, the, the clergy person, the educated one, the wealthy one, the religious one, the male one is supplanted as host of the meal. Jesus tells us about hospitality throughout the Gospels, that the last shall be first and the greatest shall be the least among them. But he also shows us how to dance the dance of perichoresis and hospitality and what it is to be undone by gratitude for who and what Jesus is. And so our scripture ends. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace which is what a dance of perichoresis really is. It is the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change and the courage to change the things that we can and the wisdom to know the difference. But I also feel in our contemporary struggle and situation that the voices that are bubbling to the fore are also reminding people like me that I might be much more like Simon than I want to admit. Come on, officer. Give me a break. That is not merely a statement. That is a worldview. That is a white bread worldview. I thank God for the dance of perichoresis because within it there is a whole lot of gratitude for a humble Savior, but not a ton of room to be special at the expense of the other dancers. I thank God for the voices that are coming to the fore in this current time that are recognizing that my own worldview, the one that I've accepted as reality that has been comfortable for me and many of my contemporaries may be coming to a close. And this is difficult this is difficult to absorb, difficult to acknowledge, difficult to hear, and difficult to act out. But it is also necessary in order for me to dance the dance of perichoresis, to dance with the divine, to be truly in rhythm with my neighbor. May it be so for you. Peace be with you.